Hallelujah. Give him praise in the house of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Give him praise in the house of the Lord. If he has done anything for you, lift your hands and give him praise. Amen. For the rest of my life, you may be seated if you can. I will serve the Lord. What a solemn vow being made here today. There are men who have purposed and have promised that for the rest of their lives, they are going to serve the God of heaven. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, let me pause just to give God thanks. The head of my life, my savior, my keeper, my friend, my companion. Give him thanks for this opportunity to stand before you around the sacred wooden desk to bring forth the word of life. I want to greet our host pastor and district overseer in the person of Bishop Alexander Sims. I want to greet Sister Sims by extension. And of course, the leaders of the local church here at Eastwood Park. I want to greet also my very good friend and brother, the Reverend Mark Phillips and Sister Phillips. They have been a part of the life of my family for a little while now. And I'm very thankful that God has brought good people into our lives, persons that you can count on and depend on and who can be true to you. Amen? Let me pause also to greet all the delegates, those persons who are here from the different churches, all the men that I see, the wonderful choir that has sung, and of course you, my brethren and friends. Greetings in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to, I think I forgot the members of the Men's Fellowship Board. Pardon me, I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord. I journeyed here this morning with a few persons from the Bull Bay Church, of course, and these young men who I journeyed with have been making their past extremely proud. Extremely proud. And the little church in the east that's at Wees Road, nine miles Bull Bay, we call her the jewel of the east. She's not what she's to be yet, but keep your ears to the ground and your eyes to the east and watch out for her. You hear me? <laughs> Amen. Amen. But this morning, my brothers and sisters, it is good to be standing among God's people to look into the word of Almighty God. I would like you to turn with me to the book of Jude. Jude, the first and only chapter. This is Jude, just before Revelation. Just before Revelation. And the name Jude, of course, is short. It's just the Greek version of the Hebrew Judah. You can also find Judas. Both of those are just versions of the ancient Hebrew Judah, meaning praise. And I want to read a few verses, starting at verse 1. And I want you to journey with me. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James... To them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Run down with me to verse 24, please. Verse 17, sorry. Verse 17, 
But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who, right, mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. There be they who separate themselves, or these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. And the church of God says, Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his richest blessings to his word. Thus far, the text. My brothers and sisters, this is one of the hardest books to preach. It's one of the hardest texts to preach. It is so designed, it is so organized and constructed that unless you are able to dig deep into its background, you won't get the meaning of it. But I want to share with you that Jude, being such a small book or the smallest of the New Testament, only 25 verses, carries a weight and a punch that we have to look into if we're going to understand what God is saying to the church in this present age. Jude brought a message that though it was written over 2,000 years ago, it has remained and continued to be relevant for the time. And so this man Jude or Judah uh, describes himself, introduces himself as Jude, the brother of James. And as the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the scholars believe or we have tried to find out which one of the James this is and which Jude this is. But we are almost certain, scholars rather, almost certain that this particular James is the half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who came after Jesus was born. If you would look into the scriptures, you would find that we are told that the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him until the resurrection or after the resurrection. And so when he identifies himself here, first as the brother of James, he waxes humble in the presence of his exalted sibling. And he declares not so much that I am the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He declares that I am a servant. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, in the one way before that he was familiar with his brother and could not believe on his brother, when God turns him and brings about that experience after the resurrection, he agrees with Jesus when he says, my brother and my father and my mother and my family are those who hear the word of God and do it. And so this Jude is passionate and he writes and he wanted rather to write about the love of Christ and, and about the, the common fellowship what we call the koinonia, the, 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 the fellowship of believers together it, it carries the idea of people who share a common business, who are in a common sphere and share the same space so like John, he wants to write about love among the brethren. And he wants to write about how good and pleasant it is for men and brothers to dwell together in unity. But as he is getting ready to write, the Holy Ghost breaks something in him. And he has to now move from so much trying to pull the church together to trying to separate it. <laughs> He started out wanting to pull the church together. But he ends up separating it. 
And sometimes when you look on it, you know, it will make you wonder what exactly he's doing. But hear what Jude says. He says, I wanted to write to you regarding the common faith. The faith of all believers. But as I was getting ready to write, I recognized that there was a danger. You know, one of the things that we have to understand, you know, church of God, is that not because we look like and sound like and walk like means that we are. You see, John spoke of a certain set of guys called the Gnostics. And in, in the book of John, he says, they were of us. But then he says, they departed from us. He looks back on the text. He says, however, if they were of us in the first place, they would never have departed from us. And if you look in the ancient language as he wrote, he was simply saying, they were like us in their form. They looked like us. They walked like us. They talked like us. They sounded like us. They know when to jump like us and when to shout like us. But he says, in their substance, they were not of us. I say to people, if you see my little son anywhere, you know, you know that he's mine. But watch this. There's another minister in the church of God here, Pastor Aiken. I don't know how many of you know him. People mistake me for him every day. But let me share this with you. If you take Pastor Aiken and you take my son and you bring them to the lab and you take a bit of DNA from both of them, irrespective of how Pastor and I look alike, you're going to find that we are only resembling in form. But when you test the DNA of my boy, the blood type, ah, the mitochondrial DNA, all of that, you're going to find that he is the same DNA as his father. Because even though many of us may look alike in form, it takes the substance of who we are inside to determine who we really are. So hear what Uncle Jude says. He says that there were men. We saw a danger of some men who look like us, walk like us. They crept in unawares. And we were unable to discern them from those who were true. And so you find that Jude begins to talk to a certain set of people. Now watch this. He was not talking to everybody. Not all Israel is Israel. He wasn't talking to everybody. He says, I'm going to tell you who I'm talking to. The first thing he says, I'm talking to the sanctified. Sanctified ones. The word sanctified means to be set apart for a particular use. In the ancient Jewish culture, when something was to be used in the service and the worship of God, they would take it aside from common usage. They would pour the oil over it. They would say their prayers regarding the dedication. And they would bring it into the house of God for the use of God. It was set apart. Now, if that vessel was ever used for anything common, something that was apart from the glory of God, then they would destroy it. Because it was sanctified. He says, the people I'm talking to are those who have had an experience with God and God has separated them for a particular purpose. Then he goes on, he says, I'm also talking to those who are the beloved, the faithful one. Those who abide in the love of the Father. And the love that he speaks of here is a love that was manifested in the past that God used when he sanctified his people. And we know the text, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, he's literally saying the true believers who have experienced God and who have come to know him, I am talking to them. And then he says those who have been called, those who are abiding in the love of Almighty God. I like the word call here. The word call here is kaleo. 
it means one who is summoned. It means that someone came and called you forward. In other words, there was a personal engagement. I said a couple of years ago that in the ancient world, for a man to be a priest, all he needed was to come from the priestly lineage. As long as his father was a priest and as long as he was from that lineage, he would be a priest according unto his heritage. And so if I am a priest and I die, my son could become priest. But there was a set of guys called the prophets and the ones who would speak for God. If they were to be effective, they could not use family heritage oh, to establish their credentials. They had to have a direct call from almighty God and so when Jesus Christ came and he wanted 12 men to carry on the gospel he went down to brother Peter he says follow me and I will make you fishers of men it is a direct call that is given what am I saying to you I am saying to you that the ones that Jude are talking to here are not church goers it is not people who feel guilty because they don't come to church on a Sunday the morning there are some people who met with God face to face and had an encounter with him and because they have had that encounter they can sing I will never be the same I am no longer as I was because the blood of royalty oh, my God. oh God I used to love some of the old songs we sing you know that used to say I'm of a special kind I am not as ordinary as you see me because I am called by almighty God the people who are called by God are not people who are forced to worship the Lord when they come into the presence of God and they recognize their Lord and Savior they enter into his gates with thanksgiving and they come into his courts with praise they declare clear it I must be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good so those to whom Jude was writing it was not the whole church but the faithful the sanctified and they called ah, there's so many of us who treat our salvation with scant regard and I'm glad the men are here I want to charge you you see, we live in a society where we are always on the back burner. We have a false modesty and a false pride that is killing us. That we like to sit at the back and say, I humble me, humble. I me no fussy. Can I tell you what it is? You are playing the game of Adam. When God asks you, Adam, where art thou? You are somewhere hiding. What am I saying? The men of this generation are going to have to rise up from their slumbering place. And they're going to have to lay hold upon that which God has called us for and we are going to have to make up our minds that we are going to make the difference yeah. so you see as he's speaking he says I'm setting you apart because this message I'm giving to you is given to you based on your credentials your credentials you know I normally say to church people you know because if you follow church sometimes, hell, let me see, you know. There are so many people in church who are not in Christ. They are in church, but they are not in Christ. And you wonder why they have no behavior. Why there is no reverence in them. You wonder why is it that the things of God does not appeal to them. You wonder why is it that they do not love what God loves. I'll tell you why it is. Because they are just hanging on. Unto those who know the Lord. Can I share this with you? It takes an internal conviction. To declare that you're a child of God. Because it's going to take more from you. Than you're willing to to give it's going to require more of you than you have to give and so the days are coming and they are here when there shall be a separation when the true worshippers of Jehovah God shall worship him in spirit too much pretending man let the redeemed of the Lord say so let the church be the church we need to rise up 
one who is on the Lord's side. Aye. So you see, Jude addresses a particular set of people. Why did he do this? Because what he was doing was not an evangelistic message. He was not trying to bring lots of people together. We, we tend to, to view our churches by how many people we have in there, you know. And we view them by how much we did have last Sunday. And how much we have this and how much we have that. Not knowing that in heart and spirit, maybe half of them no save. That's how we judge it. But Jude says, what I want are some people who are living in the presence of Almighty God that will have a spirit of discerning that they can look and recognize those who have been planted by the enemy. In other words, the fact that the garden is nice and with a lot of people doesn't mean that it's a fruitful garden because the enemy has sown tears into it. And so here what Jude says, what I want to do is that I want to give you the power of discernment that that the wheat and the tears will grow to the day of harvest but you who are called and sanctified and those who are living near to the Lord will have insight my God I promised that I would behave up here you know but forgive me so, so he says to them that there are some men who crept in unawares who are these men some people believe they are the Gnostics the Gnostics are those who John fought against vigorously. You see, they believe that all flesh is evil and all spirit is good. And so by virtue of that, they believe they could do anything with their bodies. They could live any old las lascivious way. Because God was not coming to judge them based on their body, but their spirit. And some people in church say so. They believed also that spirit was good. And I share this with you. Based on their belief, they started to say that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh because of the fact that flesh is evil. But watch this. John would rise up against them. He says the spirit of Antichrist are those who have said that Jesus has not come in the flesh. How does that really trouble the church? Let me tell you how. If Jesus did not come in the flesh, he did not walk the road to Calvary. The Bible would be lying because he would not have been tempted in all points like we are but even more than that he would not have died for my sins and he would not have been resurrected ah, for my justification therefore Paul would say if we were not having the hope of a resurrection we would be of all men most miserable but Paul was quick to tell you that God did die and raise again from the dead and because he rose again from the dead we too have that lively hope that even if we die you don't have to worry because at the last trump when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound the dead in Christ shall rise up and you don't have to worry if you are alive and remain because those who are still alive to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be caught up Amen. the entire hope of the church is resting on the resurrection and these men crept in to say that there is no resurrection and he looked on, some people say that this group of men were the libertines. The libertines were people who did not have any restraint on their behavior. They, they didn't worry about how they behaved. They were not afraid. Let me share this with you. A couple of years ago, because the holy fear gone out of the church, you know. And the holy fear was good because it helped keep me in line as a young man. I tell people that my district overseer was Bala Fire Whitik a couple of years ago. And let me tell you something. When you hear them strange noise that thought make round, you better thought fret. A couple of years ago, I went to preach before he died. And when I was there preaching, did the best I could. After I was finished and ready to sit, I heard him whoop, whoop, whoop. I said, Lord God. I started to search my mind. What did I do in the week past? What did I get in trouble with? Because you see, he was one of the ones who preached out the Mountain View Church. And we know that when the Holy Ghost would talk to him, that he would actually act on what the Holy Ghost said. And those who were not sanctified, he would take them down. But that day when I wonder what I did, it was before I actually went to college. He said, bring the young man here. God, this one now get away from God. That was a good thing, man. But let me share this with you. Ah, the days have gone when people have the eyes of the Spirit. When things 
things are not going right that they're able to discern it and any and anybody can sit down and come and even preach in your pulpit and you have no idea whether that person is living yes or no and so you see that he was saying to them the libertines were people who would go to nightclub Saturday and sing at the choir Sunday morning. Those were the libertines. They were not afraid to throw themselves around. Because look here, this was just a gathering together. It was just something we come and do on a Sunday to appease the conscience. Ah, but hear what the writer says. He begins to, this. he says, I am going to describe them to you. I can't call them by name because they are scattered in the church, but I'm going to describe them to you. He says, one, they are ungodly. They profess to belong to God, but they are godless in their thinking and in their lifestyle. They possessed a form of godliness, but did not have the force of godliness in them. Therefore, their godliness was dependent on who was looking. And as long as nobody was looking, they could be themselves. And you can't sit down here and look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Look here, I've heard women cussing. Christian women are cuss from us already. And when them trace one another and she in her terrics, I'm a pastor, I say, hi sister. Oh, hello Rev. Just come out of an anointed service and when you go, you curse off people going on the bus. Push down everybody to get in and said you are up where God is. It is ungodly. It means that it is a visit you paid. But you are not dwelling. It is the one who dwells in the secret place of the most high. The one who abides in the presence of almighty God. There is no ungodliness that can stand before the Lord. Hear the ancient psalmist. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. We can't be ungodly. Because you see, some of us are just afraid of being found out. Has nothing to do with pleasing God. I am a saint of God until I get caught. I heard one gentleman saying something and I must put a little there. Let me tell you something, my brothers. And I'm talking about the values we hold. We have an Old Testament and a New Testament in our Bible, you see. But we are not glorified, glorified versions of being a man. No, 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 no. We are servants of the most high God. We are not called to have lovers and sweetheart and be a in every parish. No, no, no. We are called to be faithful men who lead our families, who stand, oh God, as, 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 as examples to our young children to teach them how to treat the lady. I tell the church I pastor every now and then when my mother take me, I go into my home, I turn on my radio. My wife is in the kitchen. I'm going to say, come here, girl. Beg your dance. Why? Because I have to allow my son to know how he's to treat her when he gets to that age. I say to the men here, you need to be good husbands to your wife and not ungodly brutes. No, put your hand on her. Is your wife is not your child. Treat her with respect. Love her. Because you can pretend all you want. Some marriages are Sunday morning smiling, but the rest of the week miserable. My God, I wish somebody would understand what, what the writer is saying here is that we need to get rid of the pretenders. Too much pretending in the church of the living God. And we know how to jump and how to shout and we have to put in a little thing. But they that worship must do so in spirit and truth. Not only were they ungodly, they were deceitful. Deceitful. 
What do I mean? You see, they crept in unawares. They came in on the false pretenses. And you see, the lifestyle that they carried is actually the lifestyle that they used to have, but only presented in a different way. And, and here's where the danger is, you know, because we are so quick to tell people they're saved. Hey, hey, hey. We are so quick to tell people, oh, yes, you are saved, that we do not take time to see the substance develop. Hello, we are so caught up. And let me tell you this. I, I, I am all for learning. I'm going for my PhD shortly. But let me tell you something. Before I had a, a, a bachelor's, before I had a master's, and before me even know how to put a sentence together properly, you see, I met with the man Jesus Christ. And he took a little nobody. And he says, just as I am with without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bids me come to thee and when I came he made me what he wanted me to be some of us are so taken because people come in with gifts and they were celebrities in the world and they have this and have that we are so taken by them we are to be discipling them and they are discipling us We are so taken by men's appearances and by the things that they do that we have lost the power to discern. Deceitful. That's what they were. Thirdly, they were enemies of God's grace. They aimed to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now watch me, church of God. I tell people, you know, there is no past as imperfect as I. I wrestle with my own humanity. I wrestle with my struggles. They are there. And the men are here today. And when you sit down there. And tell me that nobody catch your eye. Except your wife. You are lying. You see there's something wrong with you. But you are lying. Do you know. I tell people you know man. That sometimes. Especially when you and your wife have a loud conversation. We don't argue. We have loud conversations. And we have like a loud conversation. At that time, all the Delilah, them start come up, you know. And when I hit the stoplight to go home, it is a conscious decision to turn right and not left. Conscious decision. Yeah. Because you see, brothers and sisters, these men that crept in were saying to persons that look here, lasciviousness is the order of the day. You don't need to be bogged down. God will forgive you. You don't need to put any effort in it. You just need to do your thing because the grace, the grace, the grace. But hear what grace is. One man said we must not frustrate. Ah, oh, the grace of Almighty God. Hear what David says. He says, Lord, keep thy servant back from presumptuous sin. John declares it. He says, my little children, I right unto you that you sin now but if you do sin there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty in other words sin is not a practice John says, those who are born of God cannot commit sin. For the seed of God is in him. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. And though he may fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him. In other words, don't drop down in our stay up there. He might go, come on back. <laughs> These men denied the truth of God. Uh, they denied Jesus, the one who saved them. And their desire was to seduce young immature Christians who were not grounded. Can I share this with you? And you'd ask the question, how can men like these and people like these become a part of the ground and the pillar of truth and they not be recognized? It is because the soldiers have fallen asleep at the post. The soldiers, the gatekeepers, the great wall of China was breached three times. Not because anybody knocked a hole in it, but because the guards were either bribed or they fell asleep. And everybody quarrel and cuss and say, how did the church get this way? And ah, you know, I pray that the church of old will come back. I have news for you now, come back nowhere. God is not stagnant. 
the anointing for the 60s and the 70s have been expelled. It has been used up. There's a new anointing. What God is calling for is for men with holy fire in them to stand up for righteousness. Men who says that for him I live and for him I die. Men who declare that I don't know if you want to serve the gods of this present age. I don't care if you want to follow what the US president is pushing. I don't care if your philosophy is going to bring you to a different conclusion but as for me and my house we are gonna serve the lord oh god help me we need men who are available that the holy ghost can drop upon us again and we burn with holy fire <laughs> calling back for the 60s and the 70s in now come back you could have all blood in come back not coming back why? Because God has an anointing for this age. What is missing are the people to take the anointing. Jesus. My God. You see, you see, all of us doing one thing now, you know. You see, I have to make sure that me and my family are right. You know, me understand, you know, because time tough. We have to make sure that, that you know, me light bill, pay everything. Fine, fine. I have to make sure I have Wi-Fi at home. I have to make sure that I have everything that I need at home for my comfort. And of course, you know, it is modern time now. I don't have to come to church. I can watch it on the big screen. Can I tell you, you have gotten too comfortable. Too comfortable. These men came into the church. And even those of them that were actually, uh, how can I put it, who were actually a little stirred or saved, they defected. You know, I like big dogs, you know. I have a little, a little pit bull mix in my yard. Every now and then, me go in, she run through the gate and go cause problem for me. Uh, late at night, you want to see me have a part dog. Dog a fight and me have a dog, they beat the leg of him, leg of him. And she not let go, you know. You see, unless you have a nice tin of pepper spray, if you pepper spray her, if he grab you, heaven help you. And one of the things when I was doing my research, they says that the dogs, the bigger breed dogs, you know, they have to get shots at a certain time. They have to have a particular diet. They have to be taken care of. And one thing that was stipulated, you are not to allow them to mix with mongrels. The little street dogs that walk, you know them. Yeah. And I'm saying... Is it because it's going to cause a crossbreeding? The individual says, no. Mongrels carry diseases. And so you find that when you have given your dog the shots and all the vaccination, and they come and begin to mix with that kind, then you find that they pick up the diseases that those dogs have. I share with you, and please don't get the analogy wrong before you hear, say, may I call people, may I don't call them. The truth is that you cannot mix pedigree with that which is law. And I'm not talking about place in life or family. I'm talking about those who know God and those who are playing with God. Good Christians are going to pick up some diseases, some little bad habits, some little things that are going to take away from their testimony. Cannot be mixed and remain the same. My God. And so, in light of all of this, hear what Jude says to them. Because these men have come in and everything is taking place. I want you to contend for the faith. Would you believe that the word that he uses in the Greek is the same word that he used for agony? It means to agonize. It means to put out pressure on yourself. It carries the idea of two individuals. One is a soldier who is courageous and strong. Somebody who is not afraid to face danger. Somebody who is willing to say, look here, even if I die now, I am okay. It is speaking of people who are not so much taken by other people. No, don't get this wrong, you know. A couple of years ago, I, I grew up in this church from 17 years old. I, I may not reach 40 yet, but I'm very close. Look here, I came up in this church and I heard some very heavy preaching against our politics and against the way we do things and about people not living right. But all of a sudden, no, that we are big in society. 
society and we can rub shoulders with the big ones, them who run the thing. All of a sudden, you don't hear it no more. This will turn tablecloth because a problem to the table. All of a sudden, we are not reading from the scripture. We are not declaring. We respect men. Human right. Somebody reminding me that the first one who demanded human right was Satan. Very soon, church of God. And I'm telling you this. You are going to have to make a choice. I hear people arguing about how the, 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 the gay lobby is getting out of order. Hello, this is the hand of God and you not even know. This is the hand of God and many of us don't even know. What do you mean preacher? Let me tell you what I mean. There was a time when everybody mixed up together. And we were not able to decipher who from who. But now, God has given them strong delusion. Given them up to a reprobate mind. And the thing that used to be shameful, all of a sudden they become gay pride. And everybody is proud. In other words, there is a separation. And those who love the Lord will be on one side. And those who will live for themselves will be on the other side. He tells you not to be afraid. When you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head. For your redemption, draw it now. My God in heaven, let the redeemed of the Lord get ready because God is about to pull the church from the church. Mm. And some of you don't even know that some of these lobby groups have sent spies into the concrete. Some of us don't even know that. But can I share with you, there is a time and a call to every servant of God. Hear what God says to the ancient prophet. He says, sound the trumpet in Zion. Blow the alarm upon the holy hill. Call the people of God together. It is time to get ready. You see, the soldier can't be afraid. Can't be afraid. And the second person that this word that speaks agony to contend is an athlete. The athlete is disciplined. The athlete watches what he eats. And I think I'm a little guilty of not being a good athlete. He watches his time of, of, of preparation because he knows that there's a race that he has to run. And Paul, or the writer of the Hebrews, was careful. He says, as a good athlete, you don't need to sit down. And let me tell you what the church is. The church is in civil war where Rome are burning. You know? We're fighting ourselves where Rome are burning. You know? Look here, you see. All of your friends are under anointing. And God going to bless you until God finally does bless you. Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. If you want to see church go bad, you get put in a position where people believe they belong to them and see what happened to you. People you love and respect it. People you share a common bond with. People want to cry together, laugh together, pray together, sing together, feel Holy Ghost together. All of a sudden, if God lifts you up and put you someplace, uh, who she thinks she be? And while Rome is burning... We up here I play a figure. And me did forget it. I feel it. I'm not going to let it go. You see, church of God, we have been distracted. Hear what Paul says to the athlete. He says, if you are going to run, you must lay aside the weight and the sin that does so easily be said. A couple years ago, and I see, I've seen it a number of times, there's this girl that runs in the Olympics from one of these Muslim countries. And she has a burqa. That thing, that, the thing on her head. Right. A hijab, right. And she, she has her thing. All of her clothes come down to her wrist. And she's running in these big, thick, sweat pants. You know? And she's lining up with all the other ladies, you see. And, and I watched the race with, with some measure of, of enthusiasm, you know. As I saw this girl, a butterfly last. I mean, every race the picnic come last. 
when you look at the other ladies beside her, and men, be, be careful how you do this. Ah, they were in some skimpy things here and a little midriff here. But when they took off, nobody now watched them sexiness when they entered run, you know. What they are watching is the fact that they are moving unhindered. Paul said there are some things you have that are not sin, but they are weight. You need to put them aside. And so the little habits that control us, put it aside. And I'm sharing from experience the little things that have us more, put them aside. That when you start to run, and when resistance takes you, you can run as one who is running for a prize. And even if you fall down, you can rise up like Job. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he that has begun a good work in me shall perform. My God, old time church of God would sing, the world, the world forsake me, and Satan tempts me so through Jesus I shall safely reach my goal. And so he says to them, contend for the faith. Agonize for the faith. It means you have to get involved. Now, one of the things I'm going to say to us here, you know, and the people at Bull Bay will tell you, as your minister, I'm not afraid to apologize to anybody. So you see, if you see me do wrong, no become a pastor. All you do, just be respectful about it. I say, Rev, I think, I think you could have done that one look better, you know. You know? But you see, what has happened is that whenever it is that good men sit and do nothing, evil prevails. Because it's not troubling you and your house, you whole are it. And you don't care what will happen. They could have mashed down the poor house over the side. As long as you don't breach my wall, me all right. See, I'm blind here and there. But what the man is saying, what Jude is saying, and you have to understand Jude, you know, Jude is coming out of a lineage. When Jacob was blessing his great ancestor, he says, Jude, out of Judah, the scepter, it shall not depart. This man had royal blood in him, you know. You're going to recognize that he declared it, Judah, your hand shall be the neck of the enemy. You shall hold him captive. He's talking out of his personal experience. He's saying, my lineage is a lineage of warriors. We are not coming we want some men with backbone who will declare your truth respectfully, clearly and truthfully you know something you get a look afraid if you're talking about ah. you see brothers and sisters in contending for the faith we have to know what the faith is you can't contend for something you don't know about and, and, and the faith here that is used, you know, is actually the entire body of teaching that was actually surrounded the apostles and, and, that, and that Paul and these men put together as they heard from Jesus. Thy word, O Lord, is truth. And so it established a standard that the faith we are talking about is God's word. You see, everybody have their own philosophy, you know, especially the facts that we're bright. I, I don't know what all this noise is about. And hello, you have people who used to feel the church. I don't know, forgive me for taking so long, you know. But you have some people who knew how to feel the spirit of God, you know. How to touch bases with God, you know. How they would wake up in the middle of the night and the Holy Ghost would be so thick on them that they could not go to sleep until they visited Mount Sinai. Are you with me? You go to college and to look a fool, fool professor. Tell you rubbish at your ears. All of a sudden, and I'm not cussing college people because I went to college. I am the only Sunday man to graduate from NCU doing religion. And let me tell you something. As I sat with the great scholars, because they are brilliant, you know, man. And we discussed, we were respectful of each other. And the arguments regarding my theology, you know, they could actually rub out when we think. And the arguments regarding Pentecost, they could rub it out. But you know what they could not rub out? My experience. Before I had a letter behind my name, I met with the Holy Ghost and felt when the liquid fire of the Holy Spirit surged in my being and I felt heaven kiss earth and I cast out demons, laid hands on the sick and they recover. Don't tell me! That my experience is foolishness. You can't tell me that! 
And if you believe that I'm going to become an educated fool, it's okay. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither did it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for them that love him. But they are revealed unto us by his spirit. My God in heaven. And you tell, look here, look here, look here. <laughs> oh God. You see, the people... The ones that, that he spoke about, the sanctified, the called, the one who was separated. He says to them, God is now depending on you because the faith was delivered unto you. It was delivered unto you. One of the things that my grandmother used to tell me, you know, if I company. And I say to some young people I meet, I say, even if you see me, as the one you look up to go astray. Now follow me. What do I mean? When I was a little boy growing in Niagara District, St. James. My grandmother loved guava switch. A guava switch used to use uh, and, and turn pot because it not broke. And when she thought put on that pan, you hello. And sometimes I had a little cousin, the boy bad like a gas. Every problem for getting out, we get in it because of him. And granny always beat me. So one day me asked her, why you beat me for? I'm not made with it. She said, you're the bigger one. You feel no better. Right. I tell people that even when you have a time in church, member give me trouble. Me not time for war with them. Me are the bigger one. Me no better. Right. Let me down. Let me down. Let me down. Their goal was to defend. Why? Because the standard of the church depended on the survival of the gospel. And if the foundations were removed, the gospel would have been destroyed. And so when you get down to about verse 17, Jude says to them, recall, remember some of the people, the Egyptians who were unfaithful to God, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, what happened to them? God allowed only two to get to the promised land. The angels that rebelled against their first estate, ah, oh, God has reserved them to punishment. Sodom and Gomorrah, when they fell short and gave themselves over to strange flesh, God rained down fire. He was bringing their minds into remembrance. He's saying, all of you who love the Lord, line up yourselves. Not because you are children of Abraham means that you're going to be saved. Ah, oh my God, let me cut and let me rush. He speaks about them, about Korah. And we know Korah who rebelled against Moses and caused people to follow him. They too. But let me run on. He says to them what you must do as the remnant of God. And remnant here does not mean leftover. Another leftover. Remnant here means the separated special ones. Out of bull beer, I never eat so much East Indian friend. I bad. Man, the man got them sweet, sister. Look here, man. And I get East Indian like nothing. So, you see, whenever it is that you get mango, you pick out East Indian and you kind of left it stringy. Some people love stringy, but that's all right. Me love East Indian. In other words, whatever is there, when I'm picking out, it is the special, it's not the leftover. He says to the church, come ye that love the Lord and let your joys be known. Join in the song with sweet accord and thus surround the throne. We are marching to Zion. Get on the gospel road. Get on the king's highway. And I'm closing for the second or the third time. He warned them. He says, you must build up yourself. He literally says to them, take heed to yourselves. Build up yourself in the most holy faith. How do we do that? The word keep there literally means to put out effort to remain. It means that, you see, when we used to go to school as young people, and we have long holiday, they're not, they're not do it at Kingston, my final. We have long holiday. That are the summer holiday. And we'll go back to school. Granny wake you up one, two o'clock in the morning. 
give you mojo herb without sugar. I know if you look at high semen for suck for sweeten up your mouth. We had to do this for she said your belly have to turn good for go back to school. <laughs> look here, brothers. Uh, some of us are good, well thinking, trying to serve God, you know. But someone wants some holy ghost mojo herb. If you get rid of somebody like a sitting there where we some little things that have caught on to us. Some little things that we picked up as we're behaving like, like, like little boys in big men's bodies. We need something to flash the system. So he says, keep yourself in the love of God. And the force of that in the Greek is that you are going to draw near to God in seeking his face. But let me rush down to the final two verses. He, he pronounces what we call a doxology. When the people were to remove from the presence of God, the men of God were to pronounce a doxology. And I love the doxology here. In spite of all that was happening around them, the fact that they were false brethren, the fact that all, all, all society was going haywire, he looked on them who are called and those who are really called by the name of the Lord. And he says, no one to him that is able to keep you. There's a song that we sing. Oh my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing. Victory is nigh. We like, there's a part that says, look here. Mighty men around us falling. Courage almost gone. When we see some of the men who are falling under the onslaught of the enemy. We get a little afraid. But we have to be like David when he declares it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I? The Lord is the strength. No unto him that is able. Irrespective of the time of life. Irrespective of what the lobby groups are doing. Irrespective of how hard the economy gets. Unto him that is able. Oh God. You see, the force of the text is that your strength to stand is linked to God. It is not linked to your own understanding. It is linked to Almighty God. The word keep there means to preserve from danger. It means to guard or to watch. And not only will he do that, but he present you faultless after he has stopped you from stumbling. The word stumbling here, or the word when he says from falling, in the Greek it says stumbling. Literally means that you have no control over your own weight. But he is able to catch you up and to present you faultless to confirm you with exceeding exceeding joy and as he ends he says to the only wise God the word sophim in Hebrew speaks of a watchman on a wall and carries the idea of somebody who climbs up high. That they're able to see all around them. The Greeks saw this as being a watchman. Because they used to watch the heavens. And as they could actually tell how the stars were going. They said they were wise because of it. Ah, hear what the writer is saying. No unto him, the only one who is able to watch over you. To see the whole picture. And to guard and to protect you. I close with this. When I was a little boy, we used to take the train. Because many of us here as men, we know the values that we are to embrace. We preach the nauseam. We don't need to go over there. You know them. We just don't do them. We know them. We're not done. We're not ignorant concerning them. But we used to take the train, the diesel. Diesel lot, don't 1990. When you sit down in the train and it lurch out. So it go, you know. And start pulling. There's some of us who even as men we believe. That we are not where we wanted to be. Because we have not accomplished. But no worry. When time the tree and pull off. It pull off slow you know. But you say in time it catch speed my friend. Unto him that is able. Watch me. And sometimes as we are traveling. The train ride is nice you know. Click click And then the man go up on the horn. And he, they make a melody with the horn you know man. And as we are going, sometimes some of the cars that we are traveling in, sometimes the very cars, the light's not working. And, and there are some things, you know, that are in the way of the train where they wanted to put the line. What the engineers did 
is that the engineers knew that they could not put the train at a certain gradient. So they tunnel a hole through the mountain. That when the train gets there, it goes through. Are you still with me? And so what you find is that as you are traveling sometimes, there, there is a tunnel coming up. Everything is nice. Everybody eating ice cream. Everything is going fine. And then all of a sudden, everything goes dark. Some people start to panic. Some people, choo -choo, people start to scream and wondering what's happening. But you know what used to give me solace? What gave me solace is that no matter how I am on this train and it gets dark, the line is already led. In other words, irrespective of the pressure that comes upon us, we already have a sure destination. And watch this. Sometimes I get so afraid because it's dark until I reach my stop and come off. When I come off, sometimes I walk up to the train engine where the engineer is. And I recognize when I got up there that there's a man sitting there leading the way. And he have a big light on the front of the train. And so no matter what dark place we go into, the engineer has light. He's able to see where we are going. What he is saying unto us. Sit down and relax. Though a hole shall encamp about you, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, this will I be confident. For one thing of I desire of the Lord that will I seek after. Oh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Because I am secure in him. He knows the way through the wilderness. And all we have to do is to follow him, remain in him. So what, what the writer is saying here, he is able to take care of you. If you keep yourself 